This is where I used to live for six years before I joined the EIS class of 2016. It was beautiful, but it was also very remote. And I learned some things by living in such a rural area. For example, did you know that Amazon will call you to ask if your address really exists? I also thought it was no big deal to go 180 miles round trip to pick up some organic fruit at the Gallup Safeway, or travel 336 miles round trip to eat at my favorite cafe in Flagstaff, or load up the car to go 460 miles round trip to pick up my parents at the Albuquerque airport. Did anybody guess my previous location based on my geographic hints? So bonus points if you guessed Chinle, Arizona, in the Four Corners region of the United States. I lived right in the middle of the Navajo Reservation when I had the great privilege and honor to be a physician at Chinle Hospital. I loved living in Chinle, but small town living can be challenging. For example, I used to dread going to the grocery store to buy ice cream because I worried that I would run into one of my patients with diabetes and they would raise their eyebrows at the hypocrisy in my cart. I also got to experience the rumor mill each time I gave birth at our small hospital. I must have had at least 10 visitors within the first hour of my first son's birth. I got beautiful gifts like this handmade cradle board, but as you can see from the picture, I was exhausted. <laughs> These rather minor inconveniences gave me just a tiny window into the complaints I heard from my small panel of patients living with HIV. I'm going to share some stories about people I met, but I've changed their names and identifying information, and I'm, I'm not showing any actual images. One of my patients worried about getting his lab drawn at the only lab in town because he had a family member working there. Another man worried about getting his prescriptions filled at the only pharmacy because an ex-partner worked there. I took care of a patient I'll call Kevin, who had an HIV drug resistance pattern that we typically only see in large cities. He had a prominent position in his community and he was traveling the 584 miles round trip to Phoenix to meet anonymous sex partners online. I also took care of Tyler, who didn't have enough gas money for transportation to a larger town, but he was using a sex app to meet men in and around his small community. As a clinician, I cared deeply about each of these men, not just about their HIV viral load and medications, but about what it meant to be a member of a marginalized population living with a stigmatizing infection in a small community. I wanted to do more for them. I wanted to think about, um, I wanted to prevent HIV in infection in other men who have sex with men, but I didn't quite have enough information or knowledge to think about their plight on a population level. So I joined EIS. So this is a grainy picture of me on the first day of EIS conference when I was an incoming officer. I think I look pretty nervous about the upcoming match process. Um, but becoming an EIS officer was a way to shift my expertise from improving individual lives to improving the health of populations. I joined the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention, seeking answers and new skills to better help these patients and other men like them. I hit the jackpot when I got to travel to New York City on an EpiAid to expand access to HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. I was wowed by their glitzy, sex-positive media campaign, PlaySure ads were plastered all around the city. The health department even distributed these PlaySure kits. They included high-quality condoms, lube, and a compartment to store your PrEP or your HIV medication. I got to meet Ben, who came to a community advisory board meeting with the LGBTQ advisor from his school. 
Ben shared his opinion about how we could increase PrEP awareness among other young, gay, African-American men like himself. I left that meeting feeling so optimistic about how Ben could prevent himself from being infected with HIV. He had access to New York City's sexual health clinics and could even receive free PrEP through Medicaid or other city subsidies. His state has committed $5 million to end the AIDS epidemic, and his future is looking bright. Later in EIS, I had the opportunity to investigate an increase in HIV, mostly among MSM, in rural West Virginia. Those country roads felt like they were taking me home to my small town physician roots. But it was humbling and heartbreaking to hear the stories of the men in this investigation. I met Andy, who told me that the waiting room of his HIV doctor's office felt like a fishbowl, and he worried that people would figure out his diagnosis and beat him up. He and the other men I met all said that they were not comfortable going to a local health department to get HIV testing because they worried about the stigma they would face even just in the waiting room. Sam had the same primary care doctor for 10 years, and he was never asked a sexual history or offered an HIV test. William was initially suicidal after learning of his diagnosis but he worked with his Ryan White case manager to embrace his diagnosis and educate his friends and roommates. In fact, he even invited his case manager over for a pizza party, and together they taught basic HIV facts like you can't get HIV from sharing a toilet seat and shaking my hand will not give you HIV. He also took an amazing next step and educated his friends about PrEP, and he even convinced two of them to ask their primary care doctor to start them on it. And she did. We had many conversations with medical providers during this investigation. Most were not disapproving of men who have sex with men, but a few were. And the challenge for gay men living in rural West Virginia is that they had no way of telling which places were safe to disclose their true sexual history. We brainstormed with them, and we brainstormed with the medical providers. Some providers were open to the idea of displaying a rainbow flag in a window or on an ID badge to indicate that this was a safe space. This small gesture does not solve the small town problem of being seen by nosy neighbors while you're sitting in a busy clinic waiting room, but it's a start. While stigma cannot be changed overnight, I was encouraged by the innovative use of technology to increase HIV prevention efforts in rural West Virginia. The West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources partnered with CDC to create a geo-targeted HIV testing advertisement that showed up on sex apps when people were located in the zip codes included in our investigation. The most exciting part about this innovation is that it worked. Tim told us that his friends saw the advertisements and decided to get tested. We still need to remove more barriers to HIV testing in small towns. We brainstorm strategies like home HIV test kits or meeting a person in a discreet location to perform a field HIV test. These small town challenges might just breed innovations that could change the direction of HIV testing. My experience in the field of HIV has shown me that MSM living in rural areas face very different challenges than MSM living in cities with access to more resources. But I feel hopeful that if the HIV prevention community starts paying more attention to the unique circumstances for rural MSM, we can find creative, innovative solutions to end the HIV epidemic, even in the most remote corners of the country. Thank you. <laughs>